Good morning, everybody. So good to have all of you. If you will stand with us as we sing Joyful, Joyful. Here we go. One, two, three. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Father, once again we come to you in the name of Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit. We're here because you woke us up this morning. And we thank you for waking us up, Lord, Lord time. As we're here gathered together, Lord God, we come to worship you. We ask that you open our hearts and minds that we can hear your words and resonate with your spirit that together we can rejoice this morning that we are alive. We have one more time to be able to worship you and together with all of your people across this, this, land, this city, this nation, and across the world. We come, Lord, thanking you and ask that you will bless our hearts, bless the musicians, uh, the singers, those who are here, uh, just follow whatever part is being played this day. Bless our speaker, Pastor Rick, as he comes. Give him what, oh God, we need to hear. So we thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Let everybody say. Good morning. You may be seated. Well, this would only be the part where our associate pastor, Reverend Danny Strickland, would get up and welcome you. But as you can tell, I'm not him. Uh, he is away this week, uh, back in Romania. He is officiating a wedding um, yesterday, and he's getting a chance to follow up with some of the um, uh, students that he was ministering at the camp last uh, month when he was there. So we are honored this morning to have Brother Rick Schraus join us this morning. He will be preaching, filling in. Um, Mr. Schraus is a was a pastor in Texas for quite a long time and a native of Orlando, so we're glad he is with us. And, yeah, and we're glad you're with us, whether you're here with us in person or watching us online, wherever you may be. We're glad that your Sunday morning, or in Danny's case, if you're in Romania, your Sunday afternoon, that uh, you've made time for us. So, with that being said, we invite you to stand, uh, get a chance to mingle, greet somebody, say hello to somebody you haven't had a chance to, and Brother Dan will lead us in worship uh, momentarily.
great to see so many of you here today. It's what church, coming to church is all about. Being in community, hanging out with friends. We've got a really cool friend, creator of the universe. He spoke and the universe leapt into existence. And he calls us friend, not by anything we did, but those actions of what his son did. As we're making our way back to our seat, we're gonna lift our voices about our coolest friend, our best friend, amen? One we can lean on, let's sing, here we go. Who am I that you are mindful of me, that you hear me when I call? Is it true that you are thinking of me? He's thinking about us, how you love me. It's amazing. Listen to those words. God Almighty, Lord of glory, you have called me friend. Let's sing that again. God Almighty, Lord of glory, you have called me friend. Something to celebrate. upon us to do great things but not alone with his power and all we got to say is yes I will Lord amen all we got to say is yes I will let's sing I count on one thing the same God that never fails will not fail me now you won't fail 
guys could be seated for a minute. We're going to sing this next song. We invite you to sing with us. I just want you to take a moment and think about Jesus, who he means to you, and the fact that he is alive. Have you taken time to think about that? Taken thought, you know, we don't see him, right? But we know he's there when he answers our prayers, when he comforts us, when he provides. We know he's there. But he is alive. That is the greatest differentiator of our faith versus others is that he actually rose again, was seen as alive. Amen. As we sing this next song, please sing with us. But I want you to think about just celebrating his boldness of being a God that said he was God and was God and is God. That's pretty bold. And we can have bold faith in that, yes? Not throw our brains in the trash can kind of faith, but we get to believe because we know he is alive. He was seen. Let's sing.
There's a reason why the curse of sin is broken. There's a reason why the darkness runs from light. There's a reason why we stand here now forgiven. Jesus is alive. There's a reason why we are not overtaken. There's a reason why we sing on through the night. There's a reason why we hope remains eternal. Jesus is alive. Let's praise the King. Lift your voices. Praise the King. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we come before you today humble, come to you in some ways broken, in other ways healed, knowing that you're there for us and you love us. You meet us right where we are. You know what we need. You know what is in our minds. You know what's in our hearts. You know what we're struggling with. You know what we're rejoicing this week. God, we're thankful. We're thankful to have a relationship like that somebody we can talk to, someone that we know will never disappoint us. Father, we need you because this world is disappointing, <laughs> but we know there's a world coming that is perfect, that you have designed for us. And we also know that we have a job to do, and that is to lead others to the truth, to inspire others, to come check you out, and to maybe experience the things that we have experienced in our relationship with you, God. And we thank you for that opportunity, Father. We thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Aren't you blessed by this worship team? Let's give them a hand. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Come on, come on. Okay, I guess you can't do better than that. What a blessing. Not every church has this level and quality of worship. It's awesome. My name is Rick Shirouse. For those of you who are expecting Pastor Danny today, now you know how Jacob felt when he woke up and found Laban in bed with him instead of Rachel. That's in the Bible. Even though he was disappointed, it turned out to be a real blessing for him. So let's hope the same works here with me. I know uh, you're not going to believe this because Cookie is ageless 39, but I've known Danny and Cookie for nearly 50 years. We were in a college ministry together years ago where Danny was the keyboard player, I was the drummer, and Cookie was a singer and a dancer. And we helped lead a lot of people to Jesus. This morning, if you have your Bible and you'd like to turn to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3, I've come today with a message intended to inspire boldness. Anybody here today say, I could use a little inspiration in the area of boldness? Okay, good. Good thing I came then. Because in 2 Timothy chapter 3, the Bible says, Mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of God, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. The King James Version refers to these terrible times as perilous times. And just as Paul was warning Timothy then, maybe you don't need me to warn you today, but we are living in perilous times. True Christianity, real Christians, are under attack for our doctrine, our worldview, our belief in the absolute authority of Scripture. After the Supreme Court ruled recently to allow the states to determine laws regarding abortion, we have all seen and heard the vicious reaction of those who hate anyone who believes in the sanctity of human life. One journalist wrote a column referring to us who believe in the Bible as Christian Taliban. That's right. Media portraying us as terrorists because we love Jesus and believe what the Bible says is true. Now skip on down to chapter 10. I mean verse 10 of chapter 3. You, however, know all about my teaching. My way of life, my purpose, my faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings. What kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra? The persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Everybody say everyone. So what do we do? It's right here. We say we believe it. What do we do? Run away. Renounce Jesus. Keep silent. Try to hide and blend in. No, that's really not our option, is it? If we say we love Jesus. See, there's two things Jesus said specifically in the Bible that are his will for our lives. <clears throat> Excuse me. The first is the great commandment. Mark chapter 12. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is like the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. 
Amen. Great commandment. And then in Matthew 28, we have the Great Commission. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. 2,000 years ago, Jesus challenged his disciples to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love people in the same way. And then to take that love of God and love of people into all the world. Share the gospel with him. And they did. They had a great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission. But he told them before they went, John chapter 16, verse 33, in this world you will have trouble. King James says, tribulation. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. He promised them from the beginning that it would not be easy. But they did it anyway. How'd that work out for them? Well, Peter was put to death by being crucified upside down. James was put to death by the sword. John was boiled in oil, but it didn't kill him. So they banished him to the island of Patmos, where in his spare time he wrote the book of Revelation. Andrew was put to death by being crucified on a cross shaped like an X. Thomas was speared to death by Roman soldiers. Philip, put to death by being crucified upside down. Matthew, put to death by a battle axe. Simon and Jude were martyred together by being hewn apart with axes. Bartholomew, put to death after being flayed alive and then beheaded. Matthias, the disciple they chose to replace Jesus, was burned at the stake. And Paul was put to death by beheading. And it all began in Acts chapter 7 with Stephen. Remember Stephen the deacon? Great preacher, preached one sermon that we know of, and guess what they did to him? Stoned him to death. As Saul looked on. He's saying, you know, if you want me to join this club, you're not doing a very good job of recruiting here. But it's a good thing Christianity is not a club, isn't it? You're trying to get me to join the church. I don't know about this approach here. The, and it's kind of a hard sell. Well, I'm not selling anything. I know most of the people I'm speaking to today know Jesus, love Jesus with all their heart. I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for your, your years of commitment and service. I want to thank you for those who got up early this morning and prayed. Prayed for the worship team. Prayed for Danny. Prayed for whoever was going to speak. Thank you for that. Thank you for your service and your dedication. Thank you for your loyalty. But sometimes we go weary in our service. Sometimes we lose sight of why we're serving. Sometimes it just kind of becomes routine and habit. And if we get caught in that kind of time when the persecution comes, when the tribulation lands, when the peril that was promised begins to manifest itself in our own lives personally, boy, we don't want to faint then, do we? We don't want to fall back, do we? We don't want to hide then. We don't want to blend in then. We don't want to be silent then. We want to be ready Don't be discouraged by how the apostles died. Be inspired instead by how they lived. And that he believed that what they lived for was worth dying for. Jesus. So today I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you with five reasons to continue to take the risk to live for Jesus. Now there's way more than five reasons. We just don't have the time. I don't even know if these are the top five, but they'll do. And maybe this might inspire you, whet your appetite to do some study yourself, to, to continue to seek into God's word why it's worth the risk. First reason why it's worth the risk to live for Jesus. The promise of everlasting life. John 3.16, we all know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that who would believe in him would not perish, 
Don't want to perish in perilous times, do we? But not perish, but have everlasting life. Now stop a minute. You probably hadn't thought about it in a while. Close your eyes for just a second and think about what everlasting life means. Everlasting means lasts forever. You're going to live forever. Everyone's going to die this physical death. It's guaranteed. And everyone's going to exist after they die this physical death in this world. Everyone. We were made by God to be eternal. Those who've made Lord Jesus their Savior will live forever with Him and God in heaven. Yay! Yay! Think about it. That should cheer you up a little bit. Lift your spirit. Encourage you. Ah, I hadn't thought about it in a while. Yeah! Because I know Jesus, I get to live forever with Him in heaven. But those without Jesus will exist forever as well. The Bible says in a devil's hell with Satan enduring everlasting pain, suffering, torture, and torment. This life on earth is temporary. Too many people are gambling their eternal souls by making decisions based on temporary circumstances that have eternal consequences. I don't believe the Bible. I don't believe in God. I don't believe all that Jesus fairy tale stuff and Sunday school stuff. I don't need to go to church. I don't believe in any of that stuff. Why? Well, because somebody said something bad about somebody once at a church I went to. Somebody called on Grandpa to stand up and pray, and it hurt his feelings and embarrassed him, and he never went back. I read the Bible once, said I couldn't understand. I asked somebody to explain it to me. They said, what about you, stupid? That's it. People will gamble their eternal souls because of some temporary circumstance that happened in their life that resulted in them make an e decision based on temporary circumstances that had eternal consequences. Oh, Lord Jesus, help us. The guarantee of everlasting life makes it worth the risk to live this temporary life for Jesus. Somebody say, amen. amen. Number two reason to take the risk. Everlasting love. Jeremiah 31 3 says, The Lord appeared to us in the past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Now, what's everlasting mean? Lasts forever. Isn't it almost impossible to believe and wrap your head around the fact that God loves you, you, so much that He wants to spend eternity with you? We all know people we don't want to spend another five minutes with. In fact, some of you are going to go to work tomorrow because they're going to be there. But in spite of our flaws, our warts, our, our flaws, falls, flaws and faults, Jesus wants to spend forever with us. That's incredible to think about. And God gave Jesus to it to prove it. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, everybody knows this is the love chapter. Paul describes agape love, God's kind of love. While we're here on earth, God's love for us never loses his patience. He's always offering us his loving kindness. His love means he's slow to anger. He keeps no record of my mistakes. Thank you, Jesus. He always protects us and always forgives us. At the end of the passage, it says God's love never fails. Amen? On my best day, I can't love my wife like this. I'm sorry, honey. I can't love my kids. I can't love my grand, the people I love most in all this world. On my best day, I can't fulfill it. It's always there not to convict me only, but to remind me that because Jesus is in me, I can express his love through his love through me to them and anybody else in the world as well. But even when I fall short, he does not. Look at somebody next to you and says, God's love never fails. He loves you forever. Because of his everlasting love, we can take the risk to live, live for Jesus. And listen to this now. Remember what Jesus said. Love your enemies. 
because of his everlasting love in our lives that will never fail. We are able to when the persecution comes, when the tribulation comes, when the peril becomes pressing in on us and the people who are inflicting it, we're not supposed to hate, we're not supposed to revile, we're not supposed to accuse. What are we supposed to do? Love them for Jesus, like Jesus. God's love never fails. Third reason. Third reason for taking the risk to live for, live for Jesus. Isaiah 61, 7 says, Instead of shame, you will receive a double portion. Instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance, and you will inherit a double portion into your land. And everlasting joy will be yours. Third reason to live for Jesus, take the risk, everlasting joy. Now, somebody's tempted to think, well, that doesn't sound like such a big deal. Well, if you're tempted to think that, it's because you haven't learned the difference between joy and happiness yet. They're not the same. They're not synonymous. Happiness is a human emotion produced by temporary positive external circumstances. If everything just happens to be going right in your life, you feel happy. When everything's not going right in your life, you don't. If circumstances become negative, happiness disappears. This is why Jesus didn't promise us everlasting happiness. He promised us everlasting joy. Joy is not a human emotion. Galatians 5, when Paul lists the fruit of the Spirit... Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faith, and meekness, self-control. And they're not the only fruit of the Spirit, but that's a good list to start with, correct? He lists them in Galatians chapter 5 to tell us that they are supernatural products of the presence of the Holy Spirit in, ever, in every believer. Hebrews 12 tells us that Jesus was able to endure the horror of the crucifixion because of the joy that was set before him. Joy is a superpower. Hear me? And I'm not talking about, I'm talking about superpower on the inside. Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord is my strength. That's why Paul could tell the church in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things, all things, all things. I can love my enemy. That's an all thing. I can endure whatever I'm going through. That's an all. I can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives me strength. Where's the strength come from? The joy. Where's the joy come from? The Holy Ghost. Where's the Holy Ghost come from? When you gave your life to Jesus. Wowie zowie. You can risk living for Jesus because God is going to provide you with everlasting joy. Number four. Want to join yet? Want to join the club? Want to be part of the group yet? That's a pretty good deal so far. It's sounding better, isn't it? Number four. Everlasting consolation. Now, wait a minute. Consolation. Consolation, that's the prize everybody gets who loses. Right? Remember on the game shows? And for the losing contestant today, we have fabulous consolation prize. Consolation is for losing? Mm, 2 Thessalonians 2.16. Now our Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father, which have loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope through his grace. Consolation means to provide comfort. Relief from stress, misery, anxiety. Anybody familiar with stress? Don't lie in church. Come on. Thank you. Stress, anxiety, misery. Oh, my gosh. Whew, pharmacies are making a killing off the anxiety drugs, aren't they? Or antidepressants and all those other kind of things. that we. And I'm not making fun of anybody who takes medicine. I'm just saying we all know what it's like. 
Maybe you went to bed last night. Maybe you got eight hours sleep. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you couldn't get, maybe you couldn't sleep at all because of the fear, the pressure, the stress, the worry, the anxiety that's in our lives. God says, I'll give you everlasting consolation as a result of knowing Jesus Christ. Before Jesus promised his followers tribulation in John chapter 16, in John chapter 15, he told them this. Hey, guess what, guys? You should not be surprised because just as the world hates me, the world's going to hate you in the same way. Wasn't that a banner day to be in the 12? They're going to hate you in the same way that they hate me. And look what they did to me. But before that, in John chapter 14, he told him this. It's necessary that I go away. Because if I go away, the Father is going to send you the comforter. The paraclete. That's not a funny looking bird. That's the Holy Ghost. The comforter. That's, that's not his name. That's what he does, among other things. Comforter has come, the Holy Spirit. What? How in the world could Paul and Silas, down in the dungeon of a Philippian jail, after being beaten and tortured, accused, falsely arrested, sounds like tribulation, sounds like perilous times, sounds like they found trouble for loving Jesus, casting a demon out of some woman. There they are in the pit of the of the dungeon of the prison thinking, well, maybe in the morning they might kill us. They might execute us. All for the crime of loving Christ. So what were they doing? Well, they're having a pity party, weren't they? They were looking at each other. Oh my God, I can't believe it. I can't believe it's come to this. They were, oh, woe is me, and weren't they? Licking their wounds, feeling sorry for themselves, crying out to God in great complaint and criticism. No, the Bible says that they were singing praises and hymns. They were worshiping God in the pit, in the pit of despair. Why? Because they had the comforter. They had the Holy Spirit because they had Jesus. The comforter had come in their life and it was producing as a result in spite of their circumstances or because of their circumstances, either way, they were filled with everlasting consolation. Somebody say something. You can risk living for Jesus because of his promise of everlasting consolation. Number five. Don't stop. Don't stop. Sorry. Number five. You can risk living for Jesus because of his everlasting covenant with you. Hebrews 13, 20. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the everlasting covenant, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. Now, sometimes covenant is explained to people by using the idea and the concept of a contract. Now, what's a contract? A contract is a legally binding agreement based on parties keeping the terms specified in the contract. If one party violates the terms of the contract, then the contract is immediately canceled and penalties that are spelled out in the contract are inflicted upon the person who violated the terms. For example, if you've ever borrowed money to buy a car, Okay? Unless you got the money from grandma or daddy, you had to do like I have to do and go to a bank or a credit union, some sort of finance, even the car dealership. All happy to make a contract with us, aren't they? Right? And the, they don't ever talk about the penalties. They always talk about, isn't it a pretty car? Isn't it a shiny car? Aren't the tires fairly nice? Yeah. Think of all the places you can go in this car, right? They build it up, build it up. And what do we do? We gladly sign our name to the contract. But guess what? They don't care if you lose your job and you can't make the payment, do they? Because there's no clause in there that says, we'll go easy on you if you can't make the payment. 
No. What happens? Contract canceled. They come and take the car. Do they give you the money back that you've already paid? No. They take the car. Same thing if you buy a house, right? You got to get a mortgage. It's a contract. What happens if you don't fulfill the terms of the mortgage? Penalty. We throw you in the street. We take the house, change the locks. Marriage is a contract. That's why you had to get a license. You thought it was just another tax. Well, it was, but you had to get a license and made it legal for you to be married. Somebody violates the contract of the marriage, what happens? Divorce. Not nice. Not happiness. Pain, suffering. Understand? How many of you now want a contract with God? No, you don't. You don't want a contract, you want a covenant. You want a covenant. The old covenant was like a contract. The Jewish people could never keep the terms. As a result, there were centuries of suffering and penalty. It's there, I didn't make it up. So God sent Jesus to fulfill that old covenant and to pay the price or every human penalty through Jesus' blood sacrifice. Yeah, yeah. This created a new covenant where God accepts all the risk. God accepts all the responsibility to provide for us as his children. We're his children by virtue of giving our lives to Jesus, being washed in his blood. Amen? He accepts all the responsibility and provides for his children. What did it say up here in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 20? Equip you with every good thing for doing his will. He gives his children everything good to do his will. And what is God's will for us? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Go ye therefore into all the world, into the earth, preaching the gospel, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them everything. That's his will. His will is the great command. His will is the great commission. That's his will. And he gives us everything we need as a result of this everlasting covenant to fulfill his will, to accomplish his purpose in the earth. Somebody say, I get it. I'm getting it. This makes sense. We can risk living for Jesus because the everlasting covenant can never be canceled. It has nothing to do with my performance. It's all finished work by Christ on the cross. It can never be removed. It can never be revoked. It can never be changed. He will never cancel you as his child. He'll never deny you as his child. He'll never stop loving you as his child. Never. Why? Because it's signed in the blood of Jesus. We can risk living for Jesus because the everlasting covenant can never be canceled, removed, or revoked. It's pretty good promises. Everlasting love, everlasting joy, everlasting consolation, everlasting covenant, everlasting life. Those who've died serving Christ, who've died a martyr's death, took the risk because they had the boldness, the boldness that they needed based upon these promises. We need boldness. The times are going to, it's not going to get better, folks. It's going to get worse until Jesus comes. And just as Esther was told, you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Why are you alive today? Why is it now this time in history? It's our time. It's our time. Will we step up like they did? Will we be bold like they were? We can in 1997, in a little town called Paducah, Kentucky, December 1st, it was a Monday morning, a 14-year-old freshman at the high school, Heath High School, named Michael Carneal, got in the car with his sister to ride to high school that morning. He had a bundle of blanket, blanket bundle in his arms he put in the back seat. His sister said, what's in the bundle, Michael? He said, oh, it's an art project. What it was was two rifles, two shotguns, and a handgun. 
all fully loaded. When the 14-year-old pulled into the parking lot with his sister, she got out. She said, have a nice day. She went her way. He reached in the back and pulled the handgun out of the bundle. He walked into the lobby at the front of the high school, Heath High School in Paducah, Kentucky, where students gathered prior to school, and he opened fire. He fired 11 times. Three were killed, five were wounded. If you try to imagine what it would be like if you were just standing around there shooting, hey, what would you do this weekend? Hey, uh, I forgot my locker number. Hey, did you do your homework? You know, all the things that are being talked about on Monday morning in high school before the bell rings, and then all of a sudden somebody starts shooting at you. Well, I know what I'd have done. I'd have run. I'd have hid. I'd have, I'd have got behind something. I, you know, it's just human nature. Happening at the same time that Michael walked in the door in a portion of the lobby of the high school was a student-led prayer group. The prayer group had been meeting there for several years. It had been started by a young high school student at Heath named Ben Strong. He'd had the boldness to say, hey, Let's get together and pray for our school. Hey, let's get together and pray so that people in our school can come to know Jesus. Let's get together and pray. So students had been gathering there for over a year, every morning. Not in a hidden place, but in a place there in the lobby where they were praying, praying to Jesus. And that morning when the shooting started, Ben was a senior in high school. He knew Michael. He had invited him to come to the prayer, prayer meeting, prayer group. Michael had never come. Instead of running and hiding, ducking and covering, he walked straight towards Michael and he called him by name. He said, Michael, stop shooting. And he did. He said, Michael, put the gun on the ground. Where did that boldness come from? A 17-year-old senior in high school, where did he find that boldness to confront the killer? Well, we know where. Today, Ben Strong is the pastor of Equip Church in Paducah, Kentucky. He's my brother's pastor. I know him. He's precious. He's the least, he's the last person you would ever believe that could confront a killer. He's so sweet. He's so tender hearted. He's such a he's such a worshiper. He's such a such a lover of God and lover of people. But in a perilous time, the boldness will come. It'll come. It'll come for you. It'll come for me. The same way it came for Ben. Because of the everlasting, the promise of everlasting life, everlasting love, everlasting joy, everlasting consolation, everlasting covenant. All of us have influence over someone and somebody, every one of us. I'm a Christian today because somebody had influence over me. Maybe there's somebody who comes to know Jesus all by themselves. I have met them. Most of us come to Jesus because somebody influenced us. They loved us. They were bold. They took the risk of our rejection, didn't they? They took the risk of our condemnation. They took the risk of our name calling. They took the risk of our rejection. They took the risk. And we know Jesus as a result. Amen? We're all surrounded by people who need us to take the risk. We need the boldness. Thank you for letting me come and be here today with you. Let's pray together. We live in perilous times. You know it. The Lord knows it. And we need to prepare ourselves. It can't be business as usual anymore. It just can't be about routine anymore.
I pray that the Holy Spirit is quickened within you today. The cry in your heart to be, Lord, give me the boldness I need to live for you in these perilous times. Maybe there's somebody in your heart right now, somebody that just popped into your mind because of the Holy Spirit through the words that you've heard here today. That needs Jesus. Pray for them right now. Call their name out to God, just like Ben called Michael's name. Pray for them. Pray that God use you tomorrow, at least through your prayers and intercession. Put a harvester in their path to bring them to Jesus. Maybe you have a relative, a loved one, or a good friend who's fallen away from the Lord, who's gotten discouraged, who's given in to the temporary circumstances that has somehow given them a justifiable excuse not to live for Jesus anymore. You have influence. You have influence through intercession and prayer. Maybe you're here today and you're one of those people. You say, well, I'm just not brave. I'm shy. I... I've never been able to just come out and tell people about Jesus. I'm not an evangelist. No, but you have the Holy Spirit in your life. The same Holy Spirit that the guys who in the first century went into the whole world and gave their lives for. It's still in you. It's in you. Just pray and ask the Lord for that boldness today. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the privilege to stand in this precious place with these precious people and to share your word with them. I thank you, Lord, that you watch over your word to perform it. It cannot return void. It will accomplish what you sent it to do. And so I thank you, Lord Jesus. Pray that you'd harvest the hearts of those who've heard your word today for your glory, for your praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Might I be so bold as to say uh, you know more about that maybe.